Hey, Greg, am I able to record for my for my sorry? Looking for a new church home? Come out to Holy Bethel, a church where everybody is somebody and Jesus reigns supreme. A home that wishes for and celebrates the spiritual growth of each individual member. A home that prides itself on family values, the youth, serving the community, and most importantly, God. We are proud to be led by Pastor Roosevelt Allen Jr. and Assistant Pastor Rosetta Allen. Please join us for worship at 9.45 a.m. On Sunday mornings. Now, let's get into the message. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We are so happy to be here this evening, and I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you to Holy Bethel Church of God in Christ, where we believe that everybody is somebody and Jesus reigns supreme. On behalf of our actual pastors, our senior pastor, Dr. Roosevelt Allen Jr., and our actual the supervisor of Women for Barbados, our first lady, Evangelist, uh, Evangelist Rosetta T. Allen, we welcome you out tonight. My prayer is that God is going to give us just what we need and that he's going to meet us right where we are. My name is Elder T. Archie Scott, and I'll be your teacher and facilitator for tonight. So without any further ado, let's have a word of prayer so we can get right into the word of God. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we pray tonight that you would have your way, Lord. Lord, cause me to decrease that your word would increase in me, Lord. Father God, I pray that you would take, Lord God, my words and you would translate them into each and every person that hears the sound of my voice tonight, Lord. Lord, I just thank you and praise you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. So again, we're happy to be here tonight. I'm very thankful for this opportunity to share God's word. I never take it for granted because I do realize there are many of you that are out there that probably could expound even a lot better than myself. And for whatever reason that God sees fit because of his grace and mercy, he's chose me to be able to speak tonight. And I thank God for laying that on my pastor's heart for me to speak. So without any further ado, uh, I want us to go into the word of God. I'm going to open up at uh, um, a scripture, first of all, which is uh, in the book of 1 John, the fourth chapter, beginning at verse number seven and eight. So if you don't mind turning there. The Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. One thing that I'd like to say tonight, uh, the topic that I'll be speaking on this evening is simply, let us love one another. Let us love one another. And even though it sounds so easy and it sounds so, uh, you know, I've heard this scripture from when I was a little child and, and people used to sing it, you beloved, let us love one another. And, they, and it seemed like it was just so fun. And it is. But love requires work. It does. And God wants us to love even as he have loved us. And tonight, I'm going to actually begin uh, talking about a situation that took place in the word of God. 
because I found out when you can give people practical examples and show them out of stories in the Bible, uh, it makes it become real. It makes it become more heartfelt and taken in. So there's a situation I'm going to be talking about, and I'll be coming out of the book of 1 Corinthians, the actual 13th chapter, and beginning at verse number 1 through 7. And if you don't mind, if you have your Bible, let's turn to that, and we'll do a little reading. Again, we're at 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, beginning at verse number 1 through 7. The Bible reads as follows. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I, I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. That was 1 Corinthians 13, chapter, verse 1 through 7. If you don't mind and indulge with me, I want to give you a little background of what was taking place when Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, and what he was trying to get over to the people. And in understanding the past, it shows a trajectory of where they are now. And a lot of the things that Apostle Paul wrote about in that day are things that believers are dealing with even in today's society. So here's what we need to know. First of all, the year now is about, about 54 AD. The Apostle Paul is traveling now into a place of Greece that's called Corinth. When he gets to Corinth, like his custom was, he went into the synagogue which is a Jewish church or Jewish tabernacle. And he began to share the word of God and he taught about Christ and his crucifixion and his resurrection. Because he began preaching the word of God, the Bible says others began to be drawn unto him. Others began to come more and more to Paul's teaching. And then the apostle Paul, what he did is he established actually a church that was right there in Corinth. What is amazing is a lot of times we have opportunities to be able to give the word of God to people. And believe it or not, people want to hear the truth. And if you're a person and you have the truth, you have the word of God, people really do want to hear what you have to say as long as you're staying to the word of God. So while the Apostle Paul was preaching, he, he began having others that start joining uh, in with Paul. So Paul decided, I'm going to establish a church. Now, you would think that if Apostle Paul was going to establish a church, it would be far away from the synagogue, far away from all these other uh, religious uh, establishments. But I want you to know something about Corinth. In Corinth, there were several churches several different denominations. Think of it, uh, Corinth was this, was this place that was just booming. The, uh, the economics, uh, everything about Corinth was just growing and uh, fashion. They were a great port that was out there in that same area. So there were a lot of things that were happening that was causing people to come together. But one thing that they really wanted 
was the word of God. And as Paul started preaching the word of God and the numbers began to grow, he established a church right next to the synagogue. The Bible says it was hardened to the synagogue, which means it's right there, right next to it. It was so much, he began preaching the teaching the word of God so much that it even provoked the actual uh, lead or the head high priest to leave the synagogue and go over to Paul's congregation. My God, my God. All this is told in the book of Romans, the actual, I'm sorry, in the book of Acts, the 18th chapter, it explains Paul's journey in the Greece and what things were taking place during that time. Now, here's the thing. As the church began to grow, as God began to move, you should know for a surety that the devil's moving also. Don't ever think whenever you're doing a work for God that the devil's not going to fight it. And I want you to know some of the biggest fights take place at church. Yes. If it's something that's dealing with the things of God, it, can, it doesn't have to be at church. It can be anything dealing with the people of God. And the devil's always going to try to get busy and he's always going to try to cause dissension. So Apostle Paul, as he's going out ministering the word of God, then there were people that started coming behind Paul and saying Paul is teaching heresies. He's teaching against the law. So they went and got the Romans involved with it, and they pressed hard against Paul that he would leave that area. And Apostle Paul was like, I'm not leaving this area over the gospel. I'm leaving it because you are trying to, you are trying to set me up and kill me. So Apostle Paul left others that were in charge of the actual church in Corinth. While he actually was ministering in other parts of Corinth, the Bible says that Paul began hearing that there were problems that arose in the church. You should know, as I just mentioned a minute ago, the devil's always going to try to find some way to infiltrate the people of God. He does not like to see peace. He does not like to see people working together in unity. He does not like to see God's word being being uh, um, uh, taken in and people being able to grow and people being able to repent from their sins and begin living godly lives. That's what it should be, but not with the devil. He's going to always try to find some way to pull it down. So here are some of the things that Paul began hearing, and I'm going to talk about these four categories. The very first one takes place from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter to the fourth chapter. And those things that took place were called divisions. My God. Divisions in the church. And in the church of Corinth, some of the divisions that were taking place is some people, they were just getting to, to they start making certain people more important than others. They started uh, establishing cliques and start establishing ways of acknowledging this person. And you know what? We follow Apollos. And others said, no, we follow Paul. And others had other people they want to follow. And they were tearing down each other in order to make whoever they wanted of significance to be in charge. Let me tell you all this, saints of the living God. God never wants us to tear down in order to the way to lift us up. The Bible says if we really want to be lifted up, the Bible says if we will lift Jesus up, in due time, God will raise us up. But never think that by tearing people down, by talking about people, by backbiting, by lying, by pulling people down, that that's going to get us closer to God. It is not, and it's against God. Bible says it like this, six things do God hate. Does God hate? The seventh thing is an abomination to God. And the Bible says, they that sow discord among the brethren. Paul is going to identify where the actual problems are. Now, one thing I do know, because uh, I was in the military for several years, and as a historian, uh, one of the things they taught me in writing books is how to gather your facts first. Gather the facts identify the problems, but don't just identify the problems, also write about what are the solutions. See, what happens a lot of times with people, the enemy wants them to take our eyes off ourselves 
and begin identifying the problem with people. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll look at people and we'll say, look, they're like this and they're like that. And they're no good at this. And, and it's so easy to forget. The Bible tells us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. There was a story in the Bible where these, these, uh, these, these Pharisees and these religious rulers went and found this woman that was in adultery. And they were going to stone this woman. And they say to Jesus, Jesus, the law says that a woman caught in this type of act of adultery should be stoned. What sayest thou? And they're ready to throw their stones. They're ready to kill this woman. And Jesus simply says this and writes on the ground and says this, ye that be without sin, cast the first stone. Before we get to talking about everybody else's fault, you better make sure, and I should be able to make sure that I'm not at fault myself. Because it's so easy to get drawn out and looking at others and trying to find their faults and God saying, you got just as many as they do. At least we forget the Bible says, by the same measure you meet with all, it shall be measured unto you again. The same way that we're judging others, we're teaching God how to treat us. And here's my question. If we say we are believers, we say we are followers of Christ, that is called Christianity. Then here's my question. Was it right for Jesus to go to the cross for us and he who knew no sin became sin for us? Was it right for him to do that? Did he deserve what was done to him? Or was it us that should have gone to that cross? Just a thought. So here it is. Apostle Paul is dealing with the divisions in the church from chapter one through four. The next area he wants to deal with, and this is from uh, chapter seven, uh, seven and eight. I'm sorry, not seven, eight, five through seven. Uh, Apostle Paul wants them to understand he hears that there is immorality in the church. Now, believe it or not, I know when people here in the church, they're thinking that I'm talking about, oh, people in the church just doing some immoral things. No, they were they were not just doing immoral things. They were actually doing it in the physical church. And it got so bad. And the immorality got so bad that was in the church during that time is that they had men with men and women with women. Homosexuality in the church. It got so bad that even when there was a young man that was having a relationship with his mother, my God, my God. And Apostle Paul said, we're going to have to deal with this because this is something that should not even been heard of ever having, having a, a, a person that's supposed to be representing God, having that type of relationship. God said through the Apostle Paul, I've got to deal with this immorality. Because what happened with the Corinthians, they were saying, well, hey, that's just normal. You know what? Uh, you know, grace will cover that. Mercy will cover that. Paul is saying, no, it's not grace and mercy covering that. We need to make a decision. And the Apostle Paul said, listen, I'm going to use myself as an example. What I do with myself, I have to beat my body black and blue. In other words, I mortify the deeds that are in this body. Listen, saints of God, I want you to know this. We have a choice in the matter when we have Christ in our life. Yes, we do. There have been many times I could have fornicated. I could have done all kinds of adultery and all kinds of things. I'm a grown man. You might be feeling like that. I'm a grown man. I'm a grown man. I can do whatever I want. And you know what? God will forgive me. God, it'll be all right. But I want you to know this. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, and the uh, Bible says in 6 and 19, <laughs> Apostle Paul wrote, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that Christ dwells in it? Know ye not that you've been bought with a price and that by the precious blood of Jesus? When something is precious to you, when our life is precious to it, because again, we have to remember, Jesus paid this debt he did not owe, and we owed a debt we could not pay. I asked a person a question yesterday. I said this, what would you do if there was a person that pulled a gun out on you? 
and they're getting ready to pull this trigger and shoot you, and someone jumps in front of it so they couldn't shoot you, that person had one bullet, and they shot it and killed the person that jumped in front of that bullet for you. What would you say you would do for this person? Because the person's died. What would you do for them? You said, I would, they said to me, oh, I would live for them. I would do whatever they I could do to help their, their, their family out. I would do whatever I do. And I said to them, would you do it out of obligation or appreciation? They said, it would be out of appreciation because I appreciate what they did for me. When we realize that we should be living out of appreciation for God. What is it that God can't ask us to do since he gave his life for us and he became the sacrifice for our sin? What is it we shouldn't do? Is it too hard to restrain from this immorality, these, un, 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 these perverted sex sins? Is it too hard? God said no. And if we are dead to sin, as the Bible says in the book of Romans, and alive unto Christ, then we need to be able to put ourselves, put this body in subjection. The, the third thing that Apostle Paul uh, had to deal with, uh, and this is from chapters 8 through 10 in the book of 1 Corinthians, is he had to deal with people trying to take each other to court. These are people of God taking each other to court, trying to sue them, trying to get them back for what they've done uh, by using the secular court in order to be able to put them in prison. Not only that, but they also had uh, they had contentions over if they could eat meats that were offered up unto idols. And Apostle Paul addresses it. And he says, we need all, not all to take each other to court. This is why we have a church. This is why we have a body. This is why we have leaders. So when there is a issue, the Bible says, we, we ye which are spiritual. Go to that person who you're having art with. But now just go with them anyway, because you know, I know how a lot of us will do. When we're upset and somebody's done us wrong, we come into them with attitude. Yes, we are. We got, and the neck gets loose and the fingers get loose and you know what you did and you did this as you were thinking da, 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 and I knew you were a, uh, 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 and you've always been like that and we get upset with all these attitudes and God said, no! When you go to that person, go to them in a spirit of love and meekness. What else, Lord? Considering yourself. Least you be overtaken, least I be overtaken in a thought. It's very easy to look at others' thoughts and forget. I don't. I don't want to uh, uh, look like I'm um, like the, the Apostle Paul says. It's like looking into a glass darkly, but then face to face, we look into this mirror and we forget what image we are. We forget the things that we've done, and least we forget. I haven't met anybody other than Jesus that is perfect, that got it all together. And so what happens is, as I mentioned in the title, let us love one another. That love that we're talking about is agape love. Jesus is saying we should use that same type of love when it comes down to the body of Christ, when it comes down to others, even if they're not saved. Watch, I'm coming back to it. The fourth thing that he had an issue with is that there were people that were misusing spiritual gifts. Shaba, chop. They were misusing the gifts, the spiritual gifts that God gave to them. Prophesying, they were prophesying. Supposed to be uh, speaking in tongues, they were just gibberishing. They were supposed to be interpreting tongues, or they are supposed to have the gift of faith. They are supposed to have a word of wisdom. A lot of these things, they were using to merchandise themselves. Look, I'm going to say it like this. I thank God that we're in a church where you don't have to just always get paid to do something for God. Let's just be real. How many times did you see Jesus taking up a personal offer? I know what y'all saying. Oh, he, he was talking good till now. We, we, listen, what I'm trying to say, there's nothing wrong with taking up offerings. No. But don't make taking up offering your, your uh, way of being paid for ministering. Because if the people don't have a dime, you should be able to minister like you got 10,000 people in front of you. 
freely you have received, freely give. What was happening in the church, there were people that were saying all types of things and they called themselves prophesying and some would even be saying that Jesus was a curse. Prophesying in the name of the Lord. And that's why the Bible says we have to judge prophecy. We have to judge what things to say. And you try the spirit by the spirit of the word. If it doesn't match up with the word of God, it's not God. God will never change and, 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 and detour away from his word. So the apostle Paul has to deal with them. And what he does, he's going to now in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, give the solution. Like I said, as a historian, we wrote the problems and what the issues were uh, that we were having. But not only the problems, we have to have a solution. And Paul gives us a solution. And the solution is love. He's using this word as it's been interpreted as charity. But it means love. And now from verse number uh, in the same chapter, 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and from verse uh, number 4 through 7, Paul is about to break down the, the, the workings of love. And when you have this, this is going to cure. This is the balm to any problem that you're having in a church or with believers or with unbelievers. This is the cure. L listen to this. So Apostle Paul, he starts opening up from verse number one through seven, he started the first three verses, start saying, he used himself as an example. A lot of times, if you want people to be able to listen to what you got to say, put yourself in there. Don't always point to their wrongs. Put yourself in there. Scott, even though Scott, and here's Apostle Paul, may speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if he have not charity, as the Bible said, if he have not love, we're talking about God's love, unconditional love. It doesn't mean nothing. The Bible said, even though Scott, I'm just putting my, myself in there because this is what the Paul's saying. He says, though I, Paul is saying, even if I, because sometimes people get caught up in people's names and their title and they think you walk on water. Well, guess what? A lot of us don't walk on water. A lot of us need to probably drink more water. But the reality is, is that we all got a long way to grow, but at least allow us to grow together in peace. Paul said, if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all things, if I don't love, it means nothing. He said, if I have all faith that I can remove mountains and don't love, I don't love my brethren. I don't love the sisters. I don't love people. I don't love the things of God. I don't love these. He said, it means nothing. There's no reward to that. He then goes on and said, even though I may even feed the poor, if I feed the poor, I'm profiting nothing if I haven't loved. So then Paul uses, and I'm getting ready to come to a close just shortly. Paul uses from the fourth verse all the way to the seventh uh, verse, in the chapter of 1 Corinthians, he wants to now use and explain to people, what is charity? What is love? So then P Apostle Paul says, here is what it is. Love or charity. Anytime I say charity, I mean love. And that's what I mean. Love is charity. Paul said love is long suffering. Sometimes some of us, we just, we have like a little wick, a little wick. We have a little chip on our shoulder and we're waiting for something. Don't, I'm, I hope somebody do knock this chip off. And sometimes what we do is we incorporate our relationship that we had in the world and we bring it into the church. Have you ever seen church bullies? Yeah, church bullies. Let me tell you about church bullies. Church bullies have faith that you're not going to knock their block off. That's why they try to use in church, because they know the scripture says that if somebody acts up against you or does wrong to you, you should do good to them. And a lot of church bullies, they can't fight. They want to try to put on all this big old thing like, yeah, and I, I, I knock someone out. They know me. Check my record. Y'all know how I was in the world. Are you bragging about your life in the world? Has your flesh been that ignited to be able to make you feel excited about how fleshly and worldly you are? I hope not. 
So God is saying, listen, charity, love, the love that I'm talking about, the agape love, the God love, that is long suffering. Sometimes you just have to suffer with people. I'm going to tell you, and I want you to know, though, there is a reward to our suffering. It is. You don't have to get all blown out of proportion and so mad and violent. And if I get a chance, I'll strangle them. Or if not, I'm going to I'm gonna make sure I tell everybody about them and how bad they are and what kind of people they are. I want you to know, Bible says, Jesus says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Many times the reason why you don't see vengeance come on to certain people is because you're hindering it or I'm hindering it because I get right there in the way. I want to deal with it. We're so smart. We want to figure it out. And I just, I want to figure this out because I, I don't let nobody talk to me like that and they should know better. Don't y'all know I was Joe, G.I. Joe? <laughs> it doesn't matter who you were. Bible says you should be loving and loving is long suffering. Also, the Bible then says not only is love uh, 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 long suffering, but it's kind. You know, the Bible says, if you want a friend, you must first show yourself to be friendly. Why not be kind one to another? Can you imagine just being kind? And a kind word, Bible says, a kind word can turn off away wrath. When people are upset and they're arguing and they're so mad, and don't 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 render evil for evil, but do good to them that do evil against you. You'd be surprised. It takes two people to argue. I listen to people at times. Sometimes people get mad with me and they'll be bah, 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 and yeah, 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 and yeah, 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 yeah. And I know they have to come to the end eventually. So I just let them talk. And, da, 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 and even though I may not feel that I was wrong, but I may, I may just go ahead and just apologize. Hey, listen, I'm sorry that I made you feel that way. And I apologize for doing it. What? Well, well, well. And that makes sometimes it makes them mad because they wanted to argue, but it's like they're sorry. Um, okay. Um, well, I just wanted you to know. I just wanted you to know. Uh, I don't play that. Uh, no problem. And again, please forgive me. No. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Hey, can can we do, can we just reason together and pray together? They don't want to pray. <laughs> Not only is it kind, the Bible says uh, that that love uh, envies not. Don't be envious of what people have or how things work out in other people's lives. Just know that if we will be faithful and obedient, Bible says that God will give for us to eat the fat of the ram, the good of the land. All right, watch this here. The Bible says that that love also, this is the Apostle Paul writing still, it vaunteth not itself. You don't have to try to boost yourself up and make yourself so deep and sound so deep. And I know this. I know people, you can't do nothing with them. They just know everything. And I mean, literally, you talk with some people and you 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 can't even tell them boo. They, you say boo, they'll be like, oh, boo? Yeah, I know boo. Uh, that was uh, Casper. Casper the Friendly Ghost, that was his cousin, boo. Boo was his third cousin on his Come on, people. Sometimes it's just better to just take it in. We don't have to bond ourselves. We don't have to make ourselves look like we're so deep. And we, you know, I know people that in, when they come into church, they just got to they got to look so deep, sound so deep. Everything's ecclesiastic. And they go into their King James version of talking. Praise God. Thou, thou, how art thou? <laughs> uh, okay. If, I'm okay. If. The thing is, is when we love God, just be yourself. That's it. We don't have to bond ourselves up. Bible says also that that type of love is not puffed up. You're not exalted. Also, along with that, it does not be behave itself unseemly. Have you ever seen some saints, and you already know a lot of these saints, they got these tempers, and they go when they go get mad, they gonna go off and say things and do things unseemly, and you'll be just thinking, My God, why are they like that? Because they haven't learned to trust God. And we need to understand this also. People act where they are spiritually. 
Everybody doesn't know God like you know God. Everybody doesn't believe on God like you believe on God. And we have to be able to allow people to be able to grow in grace. I remember when I got saved, boy, I thought I was something else. Uh, I got saved. I had my cigarette right here, and I had my alcohol here, and I, I was pretty good. I could, I could, I, I just, I, I could curse pretty good. But when I embraced the love of God, God didn't tell me. Now, as soon as you got saved, I don't want you doing that no more. That would have overwhelmed me. But what God began doing is he began allowing things to come in my life where I saw that these things weren't any good for me to have. And I need to start just letting it go. And I remember when I stopped all that the cigarettes and I stopped all the drinking and I stopped all the cussing. And it, there were other things that lingered longer. You may have things in your life that are lingering longer. But I want you to know that doesn't mean just because it hasn't moved that God doesn't want to move it. Sometimes we've had things in our life for a while and God wants to move them, but he won't move if we won't move. Does that make sense? He won't move unless we move. God wants to see us at least try and certain things he wants us to try to put away from us. And that's one of the things. We should not behave ourselves unseemly. Here's just a few more. Uh, uh, love does not seek your own. In other words, everything's about you. Everything's about what's good for you. Why don't we start looking at what's good for others? Love is not easily provoked, as we said. Love does not think evil and rejoice over evil. Why would you rejoice somebody got hurt? Somebody got taken down. Somebody got embarrassed. Somebody was, you know, uh, 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 left the church. You're rejoicing? The church is supposed to be the hospital so that when people are hurt and going through things, we can be that loving conduit so that when they come to church, they can be embraced by the love of the saints of God. Imagine that. Let me read these other big things. Love also uh, re uh, it rejoices in truth. Love beareth all things, uh, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endures all things when we really love. And I'm going to say this here. It is important that we begin loving like Christ loves us. We don't just love people because they uh, are similar to us. Because God gave his only begotten son to die for the sins of the whole world. And that encompassed good people, bad people, evil people, whatever type of person that is, because we were probably some of those things. And here's the beauty of it. When we start embracing that type of love and bringing that type of love to church with us, can you imagine what it'd be like entering into a church and you're greeted there, not by the ushers. You haven't made it to the ushers yet. Those were just people that were part of the church. They're just saying, hey, how's it going? God bless you. My name is so-and-so. Have a smile on your face. And welcome for real. You know when you feel welcome for real? You know? You go into the sanctuary. The ushers are there. And they're showing you exactly where you can sit. Anywhere you want to be able to sit. Find a place to be able to sit. People are moving out of the way. Turn around. They're seeing that you're new. They're coming up there. Hey, how's it going? Good to see you. I want to give you a hug. I want you to know, hey, welcome to our church. Holy Bethel Church of God in Christ. We believe everybody is somebody. And you are. What would it be like? If when we sing in the choir, everybody's singing together. Someone might not hit a certain note, but that's okay. At least they're trying to do whatever they can for God. Doesn't matter how many preachers we have. You know what? We're all one body. And that's what the Apostle Paul wanted to get over to the people. He wanted to let them know, even though we're many members, we're all one body. And if we're working together, don't you know your success is my success? Oh, but can I just be real? I'm just going to be real. About to end. Every time the women at Holy Bethel have a project that they're doing, I'm trying to find a way to support it, and I'm going to always uplift them. Always. That's my church. Those are my sisters. They're doing a work for God. 
When the ushers are doing things and they have programs, I want to support it and tell them great things. Hey, you know, I appreciate what you all are doing. Yeah, y'all, y'all make us all look good. We're a body. If I cut off my left leg, it's weaker than my right leg. If I allow my left leg to bear its own brunt, what's going to happen? The whole body's going to limp. But what happens is my right leg comes in and compensates for that. And I thank God for that. Apostle Paul is saying, listen, we should all bear the infirmities of the weak. We should all be strong one to another. And if we have faults, we should be able to confess our faults one to another in the fear of God. Knowing that this is how the body stays strong. This is how the body stays strong. None of us are better than the other person. We all need each other. And I have not figured out a, a part of my body that's in my body that I just don't need. And y'all can just take it all out. I don't need that. Listen, I want every part of the body to be able to be prosperous. And here's the last thing I'm going to say. It's a short little story. It's about a preacher who's trying to find a way to put his church together because so many things and so many problems. Every time he comes to church, there's a problem. Every time his wife is with him, there's a problem with somebody in the church. Somebody's lying on somebody. Somebody's sick with some, uh, uh, situations. Someone's trying to fight all these dissensions in this church. And he's trying to find out, Lord, I need you to speak to me. I just need you to speak to me. And his wife decides to tell him, hey, honey, I'm getting ready to go to the store. Uh, can you watch our son, please? And he's like, well, babe, I'm, I'm studying. She says, that's OK, but I'm going to leave him here. He's seven years old. I'm leaving him here and um, I'm going to go to the store. I'll be back just shortly. He's like, oh, my God. OK. All right, babe. I got it. I got it. And he's trying to think. And his son is eager. His son's got a lot of energy. And his son's like, Dad, can we play? And he's like, um, well, son. Um, I can't really explain to you everything that's going on, but um, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you something to do. I'll give you something to do. And at the same time, he's like, Lord, please help me out because I, I got to get this thing resolved. There's too many problems with the church. He was looking down and he sees this magazine that he was reading. And in this magazine, it's titled Problems in the Church, How to Resolve Them. Right next to that actual article is a giant picture, a whole page picture of a church. And he thinks to himself, my son wants something to do. He said, OK, son, um, he tears his page out and he looks at it. And while he's looking at it, he says, yeah, that this is. Yeah, I know exactly what I want you to do. Uh, son, I got something for you to do. He's like, what is it, Dad? He said, hold on. He says, okay, now let me just tear. I'm tearing the, on this side, all these pictures. Uh, I'm tearing this picture into little pieces. And he tore this picture of this, this church. It was a big church. He tore it into a bunch of little pieces. And he decided, son, I'm going to give you this tape, this little tape. What I want you to do is I want you to put this picture right back how I showed it to you. I want you to actually put this picture back just like it was. So it looks just like it did from the beginning. And I want you to then bring the picture back to me when you get finished and I'll look at it then, okay? So he's like in his mind, okay, okay, you, you good with that? His son's like, yes, dad, thank you. I, I want to do something fun anyway. So he goes to his room and the father's like, okay, now I got at least an hour because I know my wife's not going to be back for shopping. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just be studying and trying to get in my word. And God, really, please speak to me. Five minutes later, his son's knocking on the door. Hey, Dad, I'm here. I got it. And he's looking. Oh, oh no, uh, son, son, no, no. Is you good? You couldn't be finished yet. Yes, Dad, I'm finished. Son, I mean, it was a lot of pieces I tore. Dad, I got it. And he, son, I, I, okay. Let me see what you got. And he, in his mind, he already knows this is going to be a mess. And I'm going to send my son back out again. But whatever. The son goes and brings him the picture, and the picture is put together perfectly. He has tape all over the picture, but every part of that actual church that he was putting together, the picture of it is put together perfectly. And he's like, wait a second, son. There were there was a lot of pieces, and how would you have known to put this together? That's I, I just can't believe this, 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 this is like a notable miracle. Did you know where the steeple was? I don't even know where the steeple is, Dad. 
Jeez, uh, did, you, did you know about the stained glass? No, I didn't know about the stained glass. Did you know about how the doors were and the wooden features on the side and then how the actual grass was on the actual lawn part? Did you know anything about it? He said, no, Dad, I didn't know it. He's like, son, that's it. I can't take it. How did you put this together? He said, it was easy, Dad. He's, the father said, okay, son. All right, you say it was easy. Just tell me how you did it. He said, Dad, no problem. No problem. I just want you to know this, Dad. When when you when you when it took the picture right, and you you tore it all the way down, and you you know you put it in your hand, and 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 then I I saw how you held the picture up, and on on your side of the picture it, it had that church, but on my side of the picture I saw two things. I put it was M E. And I figured that if I can just put me together, the whole church will be fine. That's the message for tonight. Work on M-E. And if you're working on that, you're going to find out God will bless you in so much. You won't have time to worry about other people. Just love them. Love the, love with how things are going. Love the things that God is using you. And what looks like an obstacle, instead of it being an obstacle, just look at that as an opportunity to love someone even more. That's what I want to finish with today. That's what Apostle Paul was trying to teach the church at Corinth. Love each other unconditionally. Be like that little kid. I just want to work on M-E. And if I do that, we're going to have a beautiful church. Amen. Love one another. Without any further ado, I turn this back over to our media so we can have the announcements. God bless you. Bye-bye. Don't go nowhere, though. Bye-bye. It's offering time, Jesus. Praise the Lord, saints. It is offering time. This is a time where we all can participate, we all can give, and we all can bless the house of the Lord. So I want you to log on to holybethel.com and give on today. Click on the little Give Now button. You can donate that way. Or if you have a PayPal account, you can give uh, through PayPal, or you can give through Givelify. I want you to give and bless the house of the Lord on today. For those of you who want to mail it in, that's Holy Bethel Kojic, P.O. Box 907, Buford, Georgia, 30515. I want everybody to take this time to bless the house of the Lord and give and be blessed. God loves a cheerful giver. I'm going to pray over the offering, and then I want you to give. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this offering that we're about to receive. We ask that you look on each and every giver, each and every willing person that wants to give to see your mission go forward. We ask that you bless them, God. Restore what they need when they need, according to your will and to your way. Let your anointing guide each and every one of us to bless the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for choosing to worship with Holy Bethel and happy holidays. Here are some upcoming events that we have scheduled for the remainder of the year. Make sure to come out for our New Year's Eve watch night service. Doors open at 9.30 p.m. and service begins at 10. If you're not able to join us in person, we will be streaming on Facebook and YouTube Live. There's a Man in the House returns on Thursday, December 28th at 7 p.m. The Zoom ID is 812-8343-8092. And lastly, we have officially kicked off the church building fundraiser with a purpose of expansion. Please scan the QR code on screen to find ways to give. Praise the Lord. 
I hope you all take in those actual announcements that are made. Uh, again, if you missed any of them, just come right on back. It's, uh, this actual uh, uh, service tonight is being recorded. So I uh, definitely want to thank you once again for coming out to our Wednesday night Bible study at Holy Bethel Church of God in Christ. Again, on behalf of our pastors, Dr. Roosevelt Allen Jr. and our, our, our supervisor of women for Barbados, our co-pastor, which is Rosetta T. Allen, thank you all for coming out. I pray that something I said tonight will make you and encourage you. I want to love people, to uh, love people even that much more, and to realize this is the will of God because God is love. So, without any further ado, thank you so very much. I'll end with this little prayer, dear Heavenly Father. I pray that you will bless each and every person who is under the sound of my voice tonight, Lord. Bless them, Lord God. Save them, Lord God. Deliver them, Lord God, and set them free. If there's anyone who doesn't know you in the free part of their sins, we ask that they would pray this prayer. Dear Lord, come into my life and save me. Deliver me, Lord, that I might be all that you'd have me to be. I confess with my mouth. I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead for me and took away my sins. And if you believe that tonight, you are saved just as much as I am. So I thank and praise God for each and every one of you. Have a wonderful day. We hope to see you join in with us at New Year's. We're going to have a fabulous uh, service there. And God always speaks to us from his word. So again, come on out Sunday, but come on to the watch night service too. Take care. God bless. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.